And we turn to questions. Are there any questions? I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. His Liberal government's priority has been to abolish the national debt limit and double the deficit, adding $68 billion for a new spending and changed economic assumptions. Prime Minister, doesn't this demonstrate his government's short-sighted, twisted budget priorities? I call the honourable the Prime Minister. So what a cracker. Madam Speaker, our priority is scrapping the carbon tax and boosting family income by $550 a year. Our priority is uh, scrapping the mining tax and boosting investment and jobs right around Australia. Our priority is restoring, restoring the Australian Building and Construction Commission and adding $6 billion a year to our economy and productivity improvements. Our priority is stopping the boats, and it's working. And Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker on all of these matters, on all of these grave matters for the security and the prosperity of our country, we are being opposed by members opposite. I call the honourable member for Durbel. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How will fixing the budget strengthen the economy to the benefit of the Australian businesses and families? I call the honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, I do thank the member for Durbel for her question, and I wish to reassure her and uh, all members of this House that this government's absolute commitment is to build a strong and prosperous economy for a safe and secure Australia. We are scrapping bad taxes. We are building the roads of the 21st century. We are finalising free trade agreements with our major trading partners, and we are restoring a sustainable budget surplus by ending Labor's waste. That's what we're doing. And isn't it so necessary? to end Labor's waste because this government's fiscal inheritance was cumulative deficits of $123 billion over the Ford estimates period. That's thousands of millions of dollars. Uh, and a projected debt, a projected debt of $667 billion. $667 thousands of millions of dollars. Madam Speaker, Remember for uh, Labor's projected debt was going to be $23,000 for every single Australian man, woman and child. That's the credit card bill for every single the Australian the man, woman and child that the Leader of the Opposition uh, wanted to leave us with. Well, Madam Speaker, this government, this government understands that you cannot fix the economy unless you fix the budget and madam speaker a stronger budget a stronger budget means lower taxes and more jobs that's what a stronger budget means lower taxes and more jobs now madam speaker madam speaker we were very upfront with the australian people before the election the school kids bonus would go the income support bonus would go because you can't give what you haven't got and you Remember can't give McMahon. away to people what you just can't afford. And Madam Speaker, Labor's mining tax, which is supposed to support $13 billion worth of spending, was raising just $300 million. That's why these things simply can't be afforded. Madam Speaker, we've had $20 billion uh, in savings before the Senate. $15 billion of coalition savings, $5 billion in Labor savings, and Labor is against all of it. Labor is against all of it. Well, Madam Speaker, they just don't get it. They just don't get it. I say, Madam Speaker, no country can ever spend its way out of economic trouble. No government can ever spend money the member which for it has Madam Speaker, Tough decisions and the are for coming, and is but they are necessary decisions for the prosperity of our country. We will keep our commitments, and the most fundamental commitment of all is to restore the budget. I call the honourable the member for McMahon. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to his statement in the House that if you get on with the job of fixing the budget, you have a chance of fixing the economy. Why then has the Treasurer's budget priority? been to double the deficit by adding $68 billion in new spending and changed economic assumptions. I call the honourable the treasurer. Well, I just want to deal head on 
with this great fiction. The Labor Party's record, the Labor Party's record was $190 billion of deficits in five years. $190 billion of deficits in five years. I know that the member for Lilly is hurting about that because he promised there'd be a surplus. In fact, they all promised there'd be a surplus. There was no surplus. There is no surplus. In fact, the legacy of Labor is, over the next 10 years, there is no surplus. There is no repayment of debt. So, as you can see, Madam Speaker, uh, the Labor Party legacy of debt and deficit wasn't just for the period they were in government. It's for as far as you can see in the years ahead. $667 billion. And Labor's legacy out of all of that, Labor's legacy, which they are in denial about, is that they left an economic environment with deteriorating terms of trade, with rising unemployment, with below trend growth. Labor's legacy was 200,000 Australians, more Australians, unemployed between the time they went into government and the time they left government. And Labor's legacy in relation to economic reform was to impose more regulation on Australian businesses. In fact, 22,000 new regulations Labor introduced in just five years. And there's no sense of embarrassment. No sense of embarrassment. The problem for our opponents is if they can't be honest enough with themselves about what their legacy really was, they will never be able to deal with the challenges of the future in an honest way. They don't get it. This is their legacy. $123 billion of deficits, $667 billion of debt, and an Australia that is not, that is not as competitive with the world as it should be. That's the Labor legacy, but they don't get it. Instead, they try and create a fiction about their legacy and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it so that eventually they think the Australian people are so stupid that their fiction becomes a truth. Well, the fact is Labor were terrible economic managers. Labor were hopeless at running the economy. Labor were hopeless at running the budget. But sadly, the Australian people have paid the price. I call the honourable member for Wannan. Wannan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Treasurer. Would the Treasurer outline the government's plans to grow the economy and create jobs? I call the honourable the Treasurer. Our plans. There'll be silence on my left. The Treasurer has the call. Our plans are very clear. We have been entirely consistent for years now in dealing with what were changing economic circumstances over the last few years and, in fact, the last few decades. And we've been entirely consistent. We said, we said government cannot afford to waste there taxpayers' money. There is too money. much noise on my That's left. That's consistent line number one. And as soon as Labor started to roll out the pink bats, there was a pause amongst Labor. The Pink Bats program, remember that? Pink, gee, that was a good use of money, except it cost lives. And it was a terrible waste of money. And the, the GP super clinics, the we're hearing the every day just how well that program went. Only the Labor Party could build medical facilities that don't treat any patients. And yet, and yet they still haven't rolled out the full program. The member program. for Wakefield will desist and or of leave course, under 94 what age. waste we've seen in the NBN. Yes, what a terrible and sad story. A litany of waste and incompetence associated, associated uh, with a bill that well exceeds $70 billion if it remained on track. And a net result out of all of that, $667 billion of debt. $123 billion of deficits over the next four years, on top of $190 billion of deficits over the last five years, 
$190 billion of deficits over the last five years is the equivalent of 200 major new teaching hospitals across the country. And what are we going to do? We're going to fix the mess. Tough decisions will have to be made, Madam Speaker. Tough decisions will have to be made because sooner or later the truth was going to out about the budget. And the record of Labor, the record of Labor is rich. But we have a plan that focuses on assist. growth and jobs. We are putting $1.5 billion into West Connects, which will in itself uh, deliver 10,000 direct and indirect jobs during construction, including hundreds of apprenticeships. We're focusing on other infrastructure, such as the East West Link in Melbourne, $1.5 billion, 3,500 construction jobs, the $1 billion gateway motorway in Brisbane, again, delivering real productivity benefits and delivering real jobs. We want to re-establish the Australian Building and Construction Commission. Get rid of the corruptions in the unions. How important is that? And we are going to abolish the carbon tax and the mining tax. We have a plan for jobs. Labor is reckless with the economy. I call the honourable member, the honourable leader of the opposition. Thanks, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why is the government's priority a plan to bring back knights and dames, but there's no plan for our coa workers, for car workers, for Qantas workers? Prime Minister, why are his Liberal government's twisted priorities so out of touch with the needs of ordinary Australians? Before I call the Prime Minister, before I call the Prime Minister, I simply want to say that there was silence, as it should be, on my left for the asking of the question. I expect the same silence for the answer. The Prime Minister has the call. The, the member will resume his seat. I name the member for Isaacs. I name the member for Isaacs. The Leader, of government, uh, the Leader of the House. I move that the member be excused from the service of the House. Yeah. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the, to the left of the chair. I appoint the, tellers for, uh, I appoint the members for Parks and Dawson, tellers for the eyes, and the members for Shortland and Lawler, tellers for the nose. The result of the divisions is ayes 82, noes 54. The member for Isaacs is therefore suspended from the House from the services of the House for 24 hours. I call the manager of opposition, of opposition business. Madam Speaker, I seek leave to move a resolution which has not been moved in this form in the House since 1949. That the House has no further confidence in Madam Speaker. On the grounds, A, that in the discharge of her duties, she has revealed serious partiality in favour of government members. B, that she regards herself merely as an instrument of the Liberal Party and not as the custodian of the rights and privileges of elected members of the Parliament. C, that she constantly fails to interpret correctly the standing orders of the House and d of gross incompetency in the administration of parliamentary procedure. Before I call uh, the uh, Leader of the House, I would say to the Leader of Opposition Business that earlier today uh, the Opposition was unable to call a division on a second reading speech because they had one member only in the House. 
Subsequent to that, they called a division on the question that the bill be agreed to and then called the division off. Then when we had a division on the third reading and all the members were present, they failed, they failed to provide a speaker on the next piece of business and I suggest they get their own House in order. I now call the Leader of the House. Leave is not granted, Madam Speaker. Leave is not granted. The Manager of Opposition Business has the House, has the call. Madam Speaker, I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Honourable Member from Watson from moving the following motion forthwith. That the House has no further confidence in Madam Speaker on the grounds a that in the discharge of her duties she has revealed serious partiality in favour of government members, b that she regards herself merely as an instrument of the Liberal Party and not as a custodian of the rights and privileges of elected members of the Parliament, c that she constantly fails to interpret correctly the standing orders of the House, and d of gross incompetency in the administration of parliamentary procedure. Madam Speaker, I note that this is an example of all the noise being on this side of the chamber. The reason these standing orders need to be suspended on this, Madam Speaker, in the first there instance— There will be silence on my right so that the Speaker may be heard. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Madam Speaker, what has just happened in this House is worthy of, standing, of suspending standing orders. Never before in the history of the Commonwealth of Australia has someone been named for calling out Madam Speaker. That's what just happened in this House. Under no definition of what is within House practice or the history or anything that has happened in this parliament since 1901 has anyone claimed that the words Madam Speaker or Mr Speaker were unparliamentary. And yet not only he didn't just get warned, he didn't just get thrown out, he got named for calling you Madam Speaker. Yesterday, we had a member of parliament thrown out for laughing. Madam Speaker, we have spent months watching you laugh at every joke from the ministers at the expense of members of the opposition. But somehow, somehow that is an appropriate way to conduct the role. Madam Speaker, I don't dispute what you said before about the fact that there are times in this chamber when things are cooperative. And the example you gave this morning, you articulated in a way that I would not disagree with one bit. But I do disagree with your decision to make that argument from the chair before the Leader of the House decides whether or not to grant leave. Because that, the comments you made, Madam Speaker, were reasonable comments for someone on either side of the chamber to make, but not reasonable if you're meant to be the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Madam Speaker, it is acknowledged on both sides of this House and throughout the country that you are a formidable parliamentarian. That is acknowledged. It is acknowledged that for your entire time in opposition and when you've sat on those benches, you have been one of the people who has been able to come to the dispatch box and launch scathing and effective attacks on us as the Labor Party. And you are, you are respected as a member of parliament for that. But we cannot support you continuing to behave that way when you want to sit in the Speaker's chair. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Speaker, it has been, and for the claim of stunt that I heard from the front bench, Madam Speaker, we, we have not rushed to this. We raised concern on the, day, on the day that you were brought in as Speaker that the tradition referred to in practice, and this is why we should be suspending standing orders, that the tradition referred to in practice that non-executive members nominate and second the election of Speaker and then bring the Speaker to the chair is one of the powers of the backbench and the, the non-executive members of this House. No, no. That tradition was broken the moment, the moment you became Speaker. We then found on 13 November last year that despite the Prime Minister claiming that words specifically were sure to be considered unparliamentary, you decided that name-calling was going to be considered legitimate in this parliament. On the, 19th, on the 19th of November last year, on issues relating—we we prepare a sheet most days, I'm afraid. 
And today is the day. Today is the day when, for the first time in the history of the Commonwealth, someone is thrown out for saying, Madam Speaker, that everybody has to acknowledge that this farce has gone on for far too long. Madam Speaker, on the 19th of November last year, you reinterpreted a question asked by the member for Herbert, who had made no mention of the question being referring to numbers. I raised a point of order saying that there was an issue of direct relevance, and your response was the question was one that was pertaining to numbers, as was clearly indicated by the questioner, notwithstanding that there was no reference to that in the question at all, but you came up with a new question to get around Standing Order 104. When we had the clean energy legislation carbon tax repeal bill, you waited until the moment when the opposition were moving amendments and then decided that amendments which had been flagged and had gone through the appropriate processes of checking would be disallowed by you, denying the opposition the capacity. We weren't expecting to win the vote, but we were expecting to have our right to be able to, to, be able to make our case. Madam Speaker, on the 2nd of December last year, we had a circumstance where the Leader of the Opposition, after he was given the call for one purpose, went on to seek leave. You claimed that you had called on him to resume his seat prior, prior to him saying, I seek leave, and we asked you to check the tapes. You came back allegedly having checked the tapes, Madam Speaker, and what you told the House was not true. You told the House, you told the House that he again sought the call, the Leader of the Opposition. The tapes don't reflect that. The tapes show the exact opposite. But once again, the information provided to this parliament was changed so that you could pretend to be acting within the standing orders. Madam Speaker, the issues of time limits has been one where time and again we have seen ministers in this House be allowed to continue their comments for, for quite a period after their speaking time has elapsed. But when an opposition member asks a question, suddenly the 30-second rule is enforced and enforced completely strictly. If you want to provide a level of lenience for government members, fine. It's the impartiality of the way you do this job that's an issue, Madam Speaker. And to have a circumstance where leave is not granted for this resolution is extraordinary. Yeah. As of the action that you took today, 98 people have now been thrown out of the House by you, every one of them from the opposition. 98 love. No speaker in the history of Federation has a record like that. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, we have had a situation where we've had amendments. I remember we had an amendment that I moved to a resolution from uh, the member for Denison, where you ruled, in answer to a point of order from the Leader of Opposition Business, that the, that the amendment was too far away from the original motion. Notwithstanding that on the 2nd of December last year, you allowed the Leader of the House to move a, an amendment to a resolution from the Leader of the Opposition that completely reversed, completely reversed everything that was in the first resolution. Madam Speaker, if I, raise, if I stand to raise a point of order, you wait until the minister has completed before you hear the point of order. Madam Speaker, at each issue, at each part of this, the practice, the practice that is followed is the same on every occasion. The Prime Minister right now is laughing, but he won't be thrown out, nor should he be. But can I tell you, when he defends knights and dames, it is really funny, and we will laugh. We will. But this resolution itself, this resolution today, Madam Speaker, is not one, is not one that people rush to move. This is a resolution, and every time, whether it's a suspension of standing orders or whether leave is granted, on every occasion that a resolution of this nature is moved, it is carried forever in practice, for the very simple reason that while opposition members, when they get to this point, don't expect to win the vote, they do expect to have a situation where everyone in Australia knows bias when they see it. Yeah. And, Madam Speaker, 
We don't doubt for one minute your effectiveness as a warrior for the Liberal Party, but that is not the job you chose to take on. And yet, in the Speaker's chair, you have continued, continued to act as though enjoying the victory for your own side is your job. Madam Speaker, the Parliament deserves more than that, and the Parliament cannot, cannot have confidence in a Speaker who refuses to be impartial. Is the motion seconded? I, I second the, the member motion for and reserve has my... the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I second the resolution and reserve my right to speak. I call the Leader of the House. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I do rise to defend uh, your position as Speaker and to speak against the suspension of standing orders motion moved by the Manager of Opposition Business. And I would say to the government members that we regard this vote as a vote of confidence in the Speaker. And when the vote is taken, as far as the government is concerned, this will be a vote of confidence in the Speaker, and I am very confident that the Speaker will win. The fact that this is a stunt, Madam Speaker, is so clearly indicated by the fact that the Manager of Opposition Business came into the chamber with a prepared speech, <laughs> which he then read from throughout his 10-minute contribution to the House. The Manager of Opposition Business has been building for, uh, for this since the first day that you were elected Speaker. And I would remind him that when you were elected Speaker on November 12 last year, the Manager of Opposition Business said, when they all return to Hogwarts, Dumbledore is gone and Dolores Umbridge is now in charge of the school. From the first day that, the, that, the, that you were Speaker, the Manager of Opposition Business and his cohorts on the front bench, like the member for Graindler, the member for Isaacs, the member for Sydney, the member for Ballarat, have been deliberately trying to create an issue around the speakership by being rude, by being rude, by being aggressive, by behaving quite intolerably badly towards a woman in the chair. Now, Madam Speaker, the member for Sydney had cause to say in, in August 2012 about the then Leader of the Opposition that perhaps he had trouble with strong women in public life. She said, I think he does find it very difficult that he's dealing with two women in positions of authority, being then the member for Chisholm and the Prime Minister. But quite frankly, the Leader of the Opposition never spoke to either the member for Chisholm or the former Prime Minister in the way that the member for Isaac speaks to you in the chair, the way that, not as badly, the member of the opposition business. The member for Isaac is, is a bully and an aggressive one at that, and he has deliberately, deliberately been trying to be rude to you from his position. His shouting is over the top and loud. And it was all, I think, part of a deliberate strategy. And may I say, Madam Speaker, I'm no sook. I've been manager of opposition business for five years. I was manager of opposition business for three years in a hung parliament. I hold the record for being ejected from this place by speakers in the parliament. But I tell you what, I never complained. I never complained. I didn't stand up like a great big sook like the manager of opposition business did today and say, like one of my four children, that I've had my toy taken away from me. I know opposition is tough. Opposition is not challenging. It's not satisfying. You don't get to make any decisions. Paul Keating put it very well in a debate on the matter of public importance <coughs> in response to the then member for Flinders, Mr Reith, when he said, honourable members opposite have three more years of their lives trotting around in opposition, three more years in the corridors at night, wandering in and out of each other's offices, having cold cups of tea at 11 o'clock. <laughs> and you fall silent because you know it's true. <laughs> the, sadness is, the, the sadness is for the opposition, you lost the election. You have three years, hopefully more, in opposition, and you just have to get used to it. And when you're in opposition, you do get thrown out of parliament more often than members of the government. But when I was in government, I was thrown out of the chamber, as was the Leader of the House. As was the Leader of the House, when he was the Leader of the House. And we just put, you have to put up with it. That's the way it is. And you should hold the government to account. You should hold the government to account, because that's what a good opposition does. And the crossbenchers should do it as well. But when you speak to the Speaker, when you deal with the Chair, the way you deal with the member for McKellar 
is utterly unprecedented in this place. I've been here for 21 years. I've been here for 21 years, and I have been shocked and appalled, as I hope a gentleman, with the way that you speak to the speaker. And the fact that the member for Isaacs was named today was thoroughly deserved, Madam Speaker. Yeah. Thoroughly deserved. And for the first time that the Speaker names a member for you to move this motion of no confidence is bizarre. It is ludicrous. It is over the top. It is a stunt. It is designed to hide the fact that the opposition doesn't have anything to say about the issues that the public care about. <coughs> you have nothing to say about lowering taxation, about cutting regulation about abolishing the carbon tax, about reducing the cost of living pressures on Australian families, about returning the rule of law to the workplace. You have nothing to say about these issues. So therefore, the tactics of the opposition on my left. has been one of distraction, one of trying to create distractions from the fact that they stand for nothing. And my advice to the opposition is you've got three years to learn why you lost the election in 2010, why you lost the election in 2013. In 2010, you only hung on to power because the opposition was able to negotiate with the crossbenchers. So after one term, you had less seats than the, than the Liberal Party and the National Party in this House. And you've made no effort, the opposition has made no effort, Madam Speaker, to do the hard work of opposition to prepare policies to think about what you stand for. Graham Richardson tried to give you this advice in The Australian a couple of weeks ago in one of his columns. You should listen to Graham Richardson because he was part of a successful Labor government. Now, none of you were, I know. You were part of a very failed government. It can't have been easy for the former cabinet ministers Desist. sitting opposite or the former ministers Member to accept Parramatta. that after six years they were thrown from office in a landslide defeat and after three years they had less seats than the other side of the House. It's hard for them to accept that, I know. But quite frankly, Madam Speaker, they have to accept it and get on with the fact that if they want to ever serve in government again, hopefully a more successful one than the last one, they have to do the work. Madam Speaker, when we're in opposition, the member for Scullin, the former member for Scullin was in, uh, in the chair. He lost a vote on the floor of this House. He lost a vote on the floor of this House in, in throwing out a member. It was the member for, uh, for Patterson, member for Patterson, Bob Baldwin, the member for Patterson. The Leader of the Opposition immediately moved a motion of confidence yes, in the Speaker. Immediately. Straight after. And the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister Julia Gillard, had to second the motion. Because Labor's instinct wasn't, what, wasn't to protect the Speaker. Labor's instinct wasn't to uphold the dignity of the office of Speaker. It was to use it as a pawn, as a negotiating tool, to get the member for Fisher to come over to this side of the House and sit in the Speakership to save you one vote. That's how Labor thinks the speakership should be treated. And it didn't actually work very well for them, I hate to tell them. That's another piece of advice. That didn't go so well, did it? Unfortunately, the member for Fisher did not measure up as well as you had hoped. Now, Madam Speaker, the Madam member Speaker, on my left will desist. The Labor Party's that tactics the in this for place have been chaotic been from, day, from day one. Their questions are very broad. Their questions should be ruled out of order. But quite frankly, the Speaker has been very tolerant. The questions, if the questions being asked by the opposition, if I had asked them when we were in opposition, I would never have been able to get away with them. They are full of argument, they are full of abuse, and yet the Speaker has been very tolerant and very generous. And the reason why the Speaker has been tolerant and generous to the opposition is because she was a very effective member of the opposition over a long period of time, an effective member of government. And she knows that for democracy to work, question time needs to be allowed to run, to be allowed to flow. So she has, because of that innate understanding of how our democracy works, the Speaker has allowed the opposition to get away with a great deal more than I was ever allowed to get away with an opposition. That's true. So, Madam Speaker, rather than trying to make a political point and distract the public from their paucity of ideas by moving this motion, they should be actually congratulating you in the chair as a Speaker, because you have been much more generous to the opposition than I would have been if I was in your place. And woe betide that day if it ever comes, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I at least I hadn't prepared for this speech be, like you have. Mine are written notes, be silence not, on the my speech, not the speech that you've got. Madam Speaker, my advice to the opposition the member for is to get on with the job of opposition. As one person once said, opposition is slow, boring through hard boards, and it is. It's not something you can just deal with tactically. 
And this is a tactic, this is a stunt, this is simply designed to distract the House and the public and the people from the shabby tactics of the Labor Party. So we do have confidence in the Speaker. We have absolute confidence in the Speaker. And as long as the Speaker wants to serve in that role, we will support her in the government from this side of the House. And the vote that we are about to take is a vote of confidence in the Speaker. I'll be voting with the Speaker, and I assume the government will be too. And I'd ask the crossbenchers to, to turn their backs on this shabby stunt and to support the Speaker. The member for Greenlaw. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The member for Greenlaw. I second the motion, Madam Speaker. And we all know that this is a position that you coveted for years and years. How sad is it, Madam Speaker, that having achieved this ambition, you have chosen the low road of partisanship rather than the high road of independence that this office demands? Madam Speaker, when you were the member for McKellar, you were very fond of the big book. The big book. Well, I draw your attention to pages 563 and 564, which have a very simple principle. The Speaker must show impartiality in the chamber above all else. That is the fundamental principle upon which the reliance and integrity of this parliament resides. Now, those opposite say, oh, but we won the election. That is absolutely true. There is a majority there. But there are millions of Australians voted for us on this side, and they also deserve to be represented and not treated with contempt from the chair of the House of Representatives. It is one thing for this, leader, for this Prime Minister, when he was Leader of the Opposition, to want to trash the 43rd Parliament and come in here every day and move suspensions of standing orders and engage engage in disruptive conduct as a tactic. But it is another thing, having won the election and achieved the high office of Prime Minister, for him and his team to trash the 44th parliament. So addicted are they to negative tactics, they engage in it. And we see it every day. We saw the Prime Minister last week, while a division was being counted, while the sand was going through the hourglass, looking upwards and giving directions to you, Madam Speaker, saying, close the door, close the door, close the door. We see, time after time, the Leader of the House give instructions to you no as, the chair, as the chair, including today. And, Madam Speaker, no. and Madam Speaker oh. we have a penalty count at the moment that if it was a South Manly game and the penalty count was 98 to nil in favour of the home team, they'd be jumping the fence. They'd be jumping the fence. Because what we have, what we have day after day in this parliament, in this parliament is partisanship from the chair, is abuse of standing orders, is treatment of those on this side of the house on this side of the House with contempt. And we're seeing it by this very process. We're seeing it by the process whereby those opposite aren't even allowing this motion to be debated. They're having a suspension of standing orders. What they should be doing, what they should be doing is allowing this motion, and then it would be a vote in confidence in your speakership. As it is, it is left hanging. It is left hanging as a result of them not I even would allowing. Remind, the I would motion remind to the proceed. member to, that he must address the motion as he. I am, and that's why court. standing orders should be suspended. And you have just given a cracker of an example, Madam Speaker, a cracker of an example of your partisanship. Here I am saying why it should be suspended, so that we have the proper debate and we have a vote in your speakership and whether you have the confidence of the House, and you interject from the chair, from the chair, Madam Speaker, in order to slap that down. Well, today we had, in the naming of the member for Isaacs, the naming of the member for Isaacs, an unprecedented action taken for such 
a minimal, a minimal statement. I checked, Madam Speaker, if he said Madame Speaker, because I thought maybe, maybe there was something that was a reflection, but there was not. What we see from those opposite, and we see in this chamber every day, is the born to rule mentality of those opposite. We saw it from this Prime Minister. We saw it from this Prime Minister just two days ago with his, with his reinstatement of imperial honours, and we see it with your behaviour, unfortunately, Madam Speaker, each and every day in this chamber. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All in those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The vision required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. 
The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint the members for Parks and Dawson tellers for the noes and the members for Shortland and Lawler tellers for the ayes. <coughs> the result of the division is eyes 51 and noes 83. The question is therefore negative. I'm giving the call to the Prime Minister, who is in the middle of answering a question. Well, yes, Madam Speaker. A long, a long, long time ago, uh, the Leader of the Opposition asked me a question and I proposed to answer it. Uh, Madam Speaker, I was asked, what's our plan for the workers of Alcoa? Well, our plan is to scrap the carbon tax, which has the cost Prime Minister Alcoa will resume more than his seat. The member for Grandler on a point of order. Yes, Madam Speaker, have you ruled that the Prime Minister can start the answer to the question again? Because the clock has indicated that he hadn't begun. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I was asked, "What's our plan for the workers of Alcoa? Our plan is to save them from the carbon tax, which is costing their company more than two hundred million dollars a year." I was asked, uh, "What was my plan for the workers of Qantas?" Well, our plan uh, is to save Qantas from the carbon tax. Uh, which is costing Qantas be more than $100 on my million dollars a year. Yeah. Our plan Ryan. for Qantas is to give them the same level <coughs> playing field that Virgin enjoys, because I am very confident, Madam Speaker, that the, that the workers of Qantas are more than capable of holding their own with the workers of Virgin if they are given a level playing field. Now, Madam Speaker, what we have seen from members opposite, members opposite uh, is indignation. 
indignation about the fact that they lost the election and they have not learned the lessons. That's what we've seen from members opposite. Madam, Madam Speaker, Labor causes chaos and then they complain about the clean-up. Well, this government will clean up the fiscal mess that yeah, Labor yeah. left us. We will clean up the fiscal mess. $123 billion in cumulative deficits over the forward estimates. 123,000 millions of dollars, 667 billion dollars in projected debt. In projected debt, that's 23,000 dollars for every Australian man, woman, and child. Madam Speaker, this is a big challenge. This is a big challenge, but we are up for it. Yeah. We are up for it, Madam Speaker. That is what the Australian people voted for. That is what the Australian people expect, and we will not let them down. I call the honourable member for Denison. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, currently there are 315 children in prison-like facilities on Christmas Island, some for almost a year. According to the President of the Human Rights Commission, conditions are so bad these kids have stopped talking and refer to themselves by number rather than by name. Prime Minister, when will this stop? When will Australian governments stop being responsible for such abuse of children? I call the honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, I, I do thank the member for Denison for his question. Uh, I know this is a subject which he takes very, very seriously, and I know that uh, this is a subject that we all take seriously, but I accept the passion uh, and the compassion uh, that the member for Denison uh, brings uh, to this particular subject. Now, none of us want to see anyone in detention. We certainly don't want to see children in detention. And, Madam Speaker, I can inform the member for Denison that at the end of the Howard government's era, there were only four people in immigration detention who'd arrived illegally by boat, and none of them were children. None of them were children. Now, I regret to say, Madam Speaker, that in the period between this time and that time, more than 50,000 people arrived illegally in Australia by boat, uh, more than 50,000, including 8,000 children. And I deeply regret the fact, I deeply regret the fact that so many, so many people, uh, including so many children, took this very dangerous journey. Took this very dangerous journey. But, Madam Speaker, let's be blunt. Let's be blunt. The reason why the boat started coming the again for Watson was because desist. Labor and the Greens, Labor and the Greens, closed down the policies that had in the past. There'll be silence the on boats. my left. Labor and the Greens closed down the policies which had stopped the boats. Now, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister will resume his seat. I realise it's Thursday afternoon and there seem to be many on my left who want an early mark. I'll be quite willing to uh, help them have that early mark if we don't have some silence. The Prime Minister has the call. Now, Madam Speaker, I am, I am looking forward to the day when no one is in immigration detention. Yeah. That's the day I'm looking forward to. And the way to ensure, the way to ensure that no one is in immigration detention is to stop the boats. Yeah. And that's exactly what this government is doing. That is the way to ensure that never again do we need to put uh, women and children uh, and men uh, in immigration detention because they've come illegally to this country by boat. And, Madam Speaker, the boats are stopping. And I am pleased to tell the member for, member for Denison that four detention centres have already closed. They have already closed because of the good work uh, of the M Minister for Immigration and Border Protection, yeah, yeah, yeah. and there is more good work still to come. Yeah. I call the member for Durack. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline the state of the budget and the importance of governments living within their means? How will a government living within its means help West Australians? I call the Honourable the Treasurer. Well, thank you very much. The member for Chifley will desist or leave. The choice is his. I, I said it... desist. If you, don't, if you don't know the meaning of it, look it up. 
And then you, I thank the, the uh, Honourable Member for Durack for his question. Her question. The Treasurer will resume his seat on a point of order. Madam Member Speaker, Brandler. yes, reflections on members. Right. Reflections on members. If the member I thought that, that, that meant that he was not literate, I withdraw it. I call the Treasurer. The Treasurer will resume his seat. The member for Grandler, and he doesn't need to shout. Well, sometimes I do to get attention, Madam Speaker. Not really. And Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I'm I would, I would ask that order. you, I would ask that you withdraw the slur on the member for Chifley. I've, there is no point of order. I call the, uh, I call the treasurer. Order. The member for McMahon. Speaker, point of order. Insults are sometimes traded in this house. They should never come from your chair, Madam Speaker. You should withdraw the without reservation. And the member will not shout at the chair. That is a reflection on the chair. The, uh, the Leader of Government Business has the call. Madam Speaker, I would remind the opposition to perhaps refer to Hansard and all the epithets that I used to put up with from Speaker Jenkins, less so from Speaker Burke. And I never complained, and they should stop being a pack of sooks. Well, my dad. The member for McMahon on a point of order. Madam Speaker, successive speakers have ruled that withdrawals should occur without reservation, without qualification, and that should apply to the holder of the chair as well, madam. It the should apply is to no you. Point of order. The member for McMahon will resume his seat. Um, I would refer the uh, honourable member to page 164 of the, sp of the uh, practice and page 189, and he'll take his seat. The member. There is no point of order. Because I can anticipate that you're trying to disrupt the business of the House. The Treasurer has the call. Madam Speaker, Madam the, Speaker the Australian the people want us to talk about jobs, about prosperity, about the economy, about the fate of their children. And these shenanigans from these fools on the other side are simply undermining the opportunity for Australians to deal with the issues that really do matter. Both members will resume their seat. Now, the, uh, the member will resume his seat. The Treasurer would to assist the House by re, um, withdrawing the term for all. I withdraw. withdraw. The fact is Australians want us to talk about them, about their jobs, about their prosperity, about their family budget. And, uh, Madam Speaker, it is hugely important that we address these issues because it represents the very hope of our nation that we should be in the business of creating an economy that delivers prosperity, an economy that delivers jobs, an economy that delivers a better tomorrow and a better quality of life than that which we have had the privilege to have. That is our job as legislators and as a government. That is our job, and that is the responsibility of this parliament. And we are going to deal with those issues in a systemic and focused way. We are determined to create an economy and to deliver a budget that is focused on jobs and prosperity, that is focused on security and hope. That is what we're focused on in the Liberal and National Parties. And we do so, Madam Speaker, having inherited $123 billion of deficits from Labor. $667 billion. There'll be silence on my left. $667 billion of the debt. Member for Coria 200,000 more Australians unemployed. A deteriorating terms of trade. Below trend growth. Rising unemployment. They are the legacies of Labor. A government that has inherited systemic waste from Labor still sending out $900 cheques to dead people and people overseas as Gordon. part of a stimulus package that was the meant to have been Gordon in place years ago. The fact is that the Labor Party left an embedded legacy that is destroying the fabric of the budget in the fifth year that they never had the courage to talk about. 
expenditure by government increased by nearly 6 per cent in one year. Clearly unsustainable, three times what Labor promised. And all of that, all of that, all of that needs to be dealt with and must be dealt with now. All the way through, Labor left little time bombs and they would go off at particular moments in order to cause maximum harm. But it's not to the government, it's to the people of Australia. The Labor Party was determined to wreak havoc. They were reckless in government and they are proving to be reckless in opposition. I call the, leader of the, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Even former Prime Minister John Winston Howard <laughs> believes that the Prime Minister's plan to play knights and dames is anachronistic. Why won't the Prime Minister get his priorities right and start focusing on the jobs of people who have been losing their jobs since you got elected? The call goes to the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, the only people who are obsessing about honours are members opposite me, Madam Speaker. They are the only people who are obsessing about honours. Now, Madam Speaker, now, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition will desist. The Prime Minister has the call. The Member for Wakefield. The now, Prime Minister has the call. Now, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, as is well known, the former Prime Minister, Mr Howard, has no greater champion than myself. I am John Howard's greatest champion. But in, ca but in, case, but in, case, but in case members opposite haven't noticed, uh, this is not the fifth term of the Howard government. This is not the fifth term of the Howard government. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker the Howard government Madam Speaker. The member for Wakefield will remove himself under 94A. Madam Speaker, the Howard government was a great government in its own way, and this government will endeavour to be a good government in our way. And that is exactly what we're doing. But Madam Speaker, I tell you another respect uh, in which this is a different government from the Howard government. We have inherited a much worse fiscal legacy than the Howard government ever did. A much worse Prime fiscal Minister legacy. Will resume his seat. The manager for opposition business. Madam Speaker, understanding Order 104A, there is no way that this is directly relevant to the question that was asked. The question was about priorities. You asked the Prime Minister to explain what his priorities were. So that means anything's fine. It means that the Prime Minister is answering the question. The Prime Minister has the call. Now, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, John Howard and Peter Costello inherited Kim Beasley's $10 billion budget black hole. If only we were so lucky. If only we were so lucky. If only it was just $10 billion. Well, Madam Speaker, $123 billion in cumulative deficit we have inherited. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The manager of opposition business on Can a the Prime Minister order. at least be brought to the current decade? <laughs> no. There is no point of order. No. It's abuse of the standing orders. Prime Minister has the, has the call. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, Peter, Peter Costello and John Howard only had $96 billion worth of Labor debt to deal with. We've got $667 billion worth of Labor debt to deal with it. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I am full of admiration. I am full of admiration for John Howard and Peter Costello. They were great leaders of this country. But, Madam Speaker, these times are different. The challenges that we have inherited from a much worse Labor government than the one uh, that they succeeded are much bigger. But, Madam Speaker, we will rise to these challenges and we will, we will fix. We will fix. We will fix the fiscal hole that we have inherited. And Madam Speaker, and Madam Speaker, and Madam Speaker, I tell you, if, I, if, only, if, I, if only he had the class of his mother-in-law, that's all I can say. On that note, Madam Speaker, I ask that further questions be left on the notice paper. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. 
I called. I called. Madam Speaker, what? I'm not here. Um, the uh, member for Graindler has been on his feet raising points of order that were not legitimate points of order. Does he have one now that is? How do you know, Madam Speaker? Before because I've heard them already. And I would refer you to page 189 of the practice. I can take it from you. I'm aware of practice, Madam Good. Speaker. And one and of the things that, that happens in not just in practice. You will not argue with the in... chair. Take your seat. Resume your seat. Then give the point of order. The point of order is one of the things we do in this place is not attack families. Is not attack families of members. That is one of the fundamental things, the, uh, lines that we never cross. The member for Greenland will not resume his seat. Resume your seat. The Prime Minister has the call. Madam Speaker, uh, I, I, obviously offence has been taken. I unconditionally withdraw. The Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. Full details of the documents will be recorded in the votes and proceedings. And, Madam Speaker, uh, I move that leave of absence be given to every member of the House of Representatives from the, from the determination of this sitting of the House to the date of its next sitting. And can I, in doing so, Madam Speaker, congratulate you on the dignity you exhibited in the face of very trying circumstances today. 